So Sakana AI is back. They're the people behind the Darwin Godel machine, a self-improving coding agent. They also created the first AI that had a machine learning scientific paper that passed peer review. And they're back with yet another open source project plus a research paper published, the implications of which seem potentially revolutionary. So RL or reinforcement learning is where we attempt to teach these AIs to do something. And when they do well, we give them a reward. They get better at math or coding, and we give them a virtual high five to let them know that they're getting better, that they're getting closer. Basically, we say, whatever you've been doing, do more of that. We can also have a negative reinforcement where we penalize some actions or outcomes that tend to not to lead to the thing that we want them to do. For example, you might recall that game engine, that neural network that was able to basically replicate the game of Doom, all right? So it played the game of Doom in real time, but without a single piece of code. It wasn't software, it was a neural network kind of just dreaming it up into life as it went along. In order to get data for the game, they actually trained up a bunch of little AI agents that played Doom. To do that, they used reinforcement learning, RL, to teach them to play Doom. And here's the reward function that they used. So if the player got hit, that would be negative 100 points. It's dying would be negative 5,000 points. Hitting enemies was worth 300 positive points, right? So a virtual high five, like good job. Enemy kill, a thousand points. And various other things that improve their gameplay or progress the game forward also gave its points. And the AI went out there, played Doom, and tried to maximize the amount of points it would get by, you know, progressing the game forward, shooting enemies, etc. While at the same time, trying to avoid getting hit and especially avoid dying. This paper flips this whole idea on its head just a little bit. Here they introduce the reinforcement learned teacher. So we train a teacher model to generate explanations from question-answer pairs. So this model is given a question and it knows the correct answer. It's not trying to figure out the correct answer. It already knows it. And its goal is to output a great explanation for how to arrive at that answer. So this teacher model is optimized to improve a student model's understanding. With most RL training, the model we're training is usually the student, at least for reinforcement learning, RL, right? So we're sort of giving it positive rewards to the student for producing the correct answers. Similar to school and college, the student is the one that's being graded. If a student does poorly, we say that's a bad student. If they do well, we say that's a good student. But what if we rather graded the teacher? If the teacher taught well, and the student's score improved, that's a good teacher. If the teacher, through whatever lectures or solutions or whatever way you choose to taught, if it decreased the scores of the student, then we would say that's a bad teacher. So this model, rather than solving problems from scratch, the teacher is rewarded based on how effectively its explanations help the student recover correct solutions. And this is done with reasoning models. So for example, here they're using DeepSeq R1, right? Because it's open source. But of course, it can be the O3 model from OpenAI. Google's Gemini 2.5 Pro is a reasoning model. So most of this follow a two-step learning process. First, you train up the teacher model. So for the DeepSeq R1, it was the V3 that was likely the teacher model. And then off of the back of that, you produced the reasoning model that was trained with reinforcement learning to reason through things and arrive at the correct answer. Right, so the teacher model is trained and then its outputs are used to train a student model, which becomes the final product. So we produce the teacher and the teacher outputs lectures, let's say, or some sort of synthetic data information that then is used to teach the student and the student is the outcome of that. The student is the one that's being graded, you know, through reinforcement learning. And these teacher models are trained using expensive RL, reinforcement learning, where the model must learn to solve these problems from scratch and is rewarded only when it gets the right answer. This process is slow, costly, and often narrowly focused, requiring carefully filtered outputs from the teacher to ensure the student learns effectively. And so here's where they kind of flip around. So instead of teaching by solving, they're instead approaching it through a learn to teach perspective. They have the questions, they have known solutions, and we're asking them to output clear step-by-step -step explanations, just like great human instructors would. And they are graded for how helpful their explanations are to the student. And of course, this aligns the teacher model to its true purpose, being helpful to the students. But, and this is very interesting, 
It also allows us to use small, efficient models that wouldn't otherwise be able to solve problems on their own. So to solve the problems, you need a, a large, smart model that's expensive to run to produce excellent training materials for the student. It sounds like they can use a small, efficient models and uh, the results are quite good. So as you can see here, this is uh, the sort of a base model at 39. They add the red as the learning to solve, right? And so using that approach, they bump it up to 46.6. But with this new approach, the learning how to teach approach, they get it up to 49.5. And they use the AIME, competition math, and the GPQA. So a lot of the benchmarks that we see, this is what they're sort of, they're benchmarked on to see how well they perform. And as I say here, the result is surprising. We had multiple papers in the last few weeks that were surprising. When we find new ways to approach some of these problems, these training methods. Some of them have very surprising results in how effective they are, even though intuitively they might not make a lot of sense. These uh, compact teachers with only the 7 billion parameters, so that's a very, very small model, are better at teaching reasoning skills than order of magnitude larger LLMs, or orders of magnitude as they're saying here, so 100 times bigger, 1000 times bigger, thus making advanced AI more affordable and much faster to train. And here they have a pretty good diagram of learning to solve. So you have this base model, the large and expensive DeepSeq V3 in this case. So you have the various tasks that you sort of put into the teacher model, the DeepSeq R10. The answer data is uh, graded, so to speak, right? So they're getting rewards for getting that correct, right? So when they, when they answer correctly, they get rewards and reinforcement learning. This process happens until the model gets better and better at answering those questions correctly. So this is its doggy treat. So when it does the right trick. And finally, this cold start distillation process into the sort of final model. So it means cold start, meaning that it might not have too much prior knowledge, right? So we're kind of um, using this reinforcement learning to put all that knowledge into the model. Distillation is kind of copying the previous model's behavior. So in effect, we're using what's produced by the teacher model, the answers to make that final model that we're actually going to be using for the tasks. In this case, a DeepSeq R1, for example. So this is kind of the normal process, and this is probably how all the labs are doing this to create their final reasoning models or some variations of this, but this kind of is a big picture of what that looks like. Notice everything kind of relies on the tasks and the answer data and the reinforcement learning is using those things. In the learning to teach approach, it's a little bit different because, you know, we take the small, cheap and expensive, in this case, a 7 billion parameter base model. We use the tasks to create this teacher model that produces not the answers because it knows the answers, but rather explanation data. And importantly, the reward, the RL loop comes from how well this explanation data helps the student model perform on answering those questions. If it does well, right, the reward feedback goes to the teacher model. So it knows, okay, these sort of explanations are better for these student models to understand how to do these tasks. So this becomes the RL loop. Then finally, once it's completed, we take that explanation data and we use that to do the cold start distillation to the final model. So as they continue here through RL, expensive LLMs learn to solve intricate math, coding, and logical problems from scratch. They do this through trial and error, through this process of reinforcement learning, and this is highly effective. But it has some drawbacks, and notably, these models tend to become narrowly focused. They're good at the tasks they have been trained on, but less capable of generalizing to broader applications. So they're taught to arrive at the right answer, but not necessarily how to think about arriving at the right answer. And as they put it here, the unreasonable effectiveness of tiny specialized teachers. And they're putting their RLT model to test against the best known methods in the field. Again, this RLT model is just 7 billion parameters. It's definitely small on the tiny side. And it's competing against a much larger models like DeepSeq R1 and QVQ. This is Quen's reasoning model, one of them in the series of reasoning models. And they're using GPT-4 Mini to clean up the outputs before using them to train student models. Even so, the much smaller RLT outperformed them across multiple challenging benchmarks in math and science. 
So here at the top, we have the DeepSeek R1 as the teacher with 671 billion parameters, like a pretty hefty model. And we have our RLT teacher at 7 billion, much, much smaller, right? One tenth of the size. They're both teaching Quen 7 billion. How to do various tasks on the AIME, MAF, GPQA, Diamond, so these complicated benchmarks, right? And so this top line is sort of how it starts. So as you can see here, it's it's not great. It's a 39 point overall, you know, if you kind of average all of them together. If we're using the big DeepSeek R1 model as the trainer, well, it gets a lot better, right? So it jumps to 46.6 .6 overall. So this massive model gives it a good boost, a good improvement, but the tiny 7 billion model, as you can see, pushes even further to 49.5. So keep in mind that these uh, smaller models are going to be much faster, much cheaper. It's going to be more possible to run it on even perhaps consumer grade hardware. Point being is you can get a lot more done with the same amount of compute that you have. And the results are better than these massive models. And here at the bottom, they're answering the question, can the smaller teacher teach the bigger student, right? So a 7 billion parameter teacher. Can it teach the 32 billion parameter student? And we still see excellent outcomes, even though the student is a much larger model. They highlight what a big difference the cost of the models makes. So since these models are much smaller, from a cost perspective, the difference is dramatic. Train the 32 billion student with our method took less than a day on a single compute node, while traditional RL would have taken months on the same hardware. So while the results are better, it's much, much faster, much, much cheaper. This training also creates better reasoning steps. The explanations are more focused and even managed to add additional logical steps omitted by R1 using a clear and direct language. They mirror the conciseness and clarity of expert human educators. So the future, a new frontier of more advanced and cheaper reasoning models. Again, as more people read this paper and begin applying this, we could see a revolution of sorts in how we train these models. Again, we're not going to see it for a while, but if this approach works as well as it seems to in this paper, I mean, think about the cost savings. We went from months of training down to a single day. So to put that in perspective, that's the difference between training a model up for $10,000 using this approach, where taking the traditional RL approach would cost something like half a million. And that half a million model wouldn't perform as well as the $10,000 model. Again, this seems like a big deal if it's easily adaptable to how we train models, if there's no downsides, this could be quite a big revolution of sorts. Also, as they point out here, this shift to their new approach makes it possible to apply reinforcement learning in areas once considered too difficult for language models to handle directly. If you think about it, there's a lot of great teachers out there, perhaps math teachers, that are excellent at explaining how to do certain proofs or certain math problems. Those people might not be that great at coming up initially with that idea, so they might not have been able to solve that on their own, which is what we're asking these models to do. We're kind of from scratch going, all right, how do you solve it? Figure it out, right? But those teachers might be excellent at explaining to students how to approach that problem. So again, if this holds, this could be huge. As they say here, RLTs could disrupt the cost of training advanced models. Instead of relying on massive systems at every stage, we can train small, specialized teachers and use them to teach much larger models efficiently. This flips the traditional scaling paradigm. The heaviest work is handled by compact, affordable models that unlock powerful capabilities in the students they train. Looking ahead, this framework hints at something even more intriguing, a model that plays both the teacher and the student roles at once. By generating explanations for its own benefit, such a system could learn how to teach itself better over time. This idea echoes the vision of the Darwin Godel machine. Again, Sakana AI is behind that one as well. They've created a self-evolving model that improves its own ability to do various coding tasks. It creates code that makes it better at coding. It's wild. As I say here, it evolves through self-reflection and recursive learning. So Sakana AI, once again, dropping 
huge papers that seem absolutely massive. I've covered the Darwin Godel machine in a different video, but the basic idea is it tries a lot of different approaches to improve itself, typing up a new tools for itself, new abilities, new approaches. And each time it kind of tests if that new approach or ability or whatever improves its ability to code. And they use the SWE bench, a benchmark in this case, to see if it does better on it, that means it improved. And over time, it uses kind of this evolutionary approach, right? So there's a certain ideas that when they work, it continues trying to find more ideas kind of in that direction. And these form certain lineages, uh, some of them kind of going extinct because they're dead ends. It, it doesn't work to improve it. That's fine because some of them are real champion lineages that come up to create the best possible outcomes. Here's the progress, as you can see here, it goes up, you know, test a bunch of different stuff and, but every once in a while it just jumps up in its ability. All of this is kind of suggesting the same thing, that we're beginning this self-recursive process of these models improving themselves. Smaller models are better at teaching the next generation of models. These models with certain scaffolding are better at creating tools for itself to improve itself. And we're going to be seeing a lot more of this moving forward because, in effect, we're now letting AI handle some of the... AI research, some of the machine learning research. We're still in the early stages of that, but I feel like it's going to get faster and faster and kind of like build on itself. It's going to start to snowball. Let me know what you think about this. Will the markets react to this just like they did to the deep seek originally by losing a trillion dollars of global market caps in a day? Or is the fact that now a $7 billion model can train a much better model could that also imply that it's going to be a lot more accessible to everyday people and more researchers in smaller labs? It's going to allow them to jump in and start training their own models using Sakana AI's approach. Let me know what you think. I'm curious to know what you think of this, how big it is. Again, we've yet to see how the other labs sort of react to this. They announced it just within the last 24 hours. And since they're not as well known as Google and OpenAI and Anthropic, Maybe it'll take a while for this news to kind of percolate through the industry, but make no mistake, Sakana AI tends to hit above their weight. Notice they've published everything on GitHub. This is open source. This code, this everything is available to everyone. It even has the one thing that none of us can resist, and that is the cutesy anime characters. Not sure why they made this one look sad. Let me know what you think. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.